Sing it. 
heard his name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen.
has kicked us out of the church. He's kicked us out of the mosque, the tabernacle, the temple, whatever place of worship from all around this country. God has told us to get out. And those of us who are blessed to be able to come in, we have to know that somehow we have to impress upon each other more love. More love. Love is the one thing that is hard for someone else to go in your life. Because I can love you even if you don't love me. And God wants us to love ye one another. Whatever goes on in this life, he impressed upon God wants us to make sure that above all things, he said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples when you love one another. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our lives. And Lord, all of us have fallen short of your glory. Lord, all of us are listening right now. After all that's been going on these last few weeks, Lord, you can say anything and our hearts are receptive. Because, Lord, now we have a clear view of who you are and all that you can do. We ask that you would guide us, Lord, and keep us in your care during these days. But not just these days, but every day. Keep us, Lord, so that we may tell others of your goodness, so they can see our lives and know that there is a blessing in serving you. Thank you. 
have to pay for. So the young lad started doing some odd jobs around town, cutting grass, washing cars, doing everything he could to buy the boat back. And after he got enough money, he went back to the store, bought the sailboat, and as he walked out, he clenched it in his arms and says, now you're my boat twice. You're my boat first because I made you. You're my boat second because I bought you back. Church, that's the message of Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 3. That no matter how far we drift away from God, God uses radical methods to redeem his people for his glory. God uses radical methods to redeem his people for his glory. As we look at this text, Isaiah writes this text at a time where Israel faces double trouble. They face double trouble because physically they are bound into Babylonian captivity. Spiritually, they are bound by guilt of their own disobedience to God. They're in dire straits in need of radical redemption. And when it seems like there is no way out, God comes in through the prophet Isaiah and encourages them not to fear because he has come to redeem his people for his glory. That God will use radical methods to buy his people back. But it's not about them. It's about his glory. And church, that's a message for us today. Redemption is for us. But it's not about us. God uses radical methods to redeem his people, but it's all for his glory. God is a radical redeemer. Yes, he is. And he shows us how radical he is in these verses. He shows three ways of being a radical redeemer. First of all, he shows us he's a radical redeemer by telling us that God comforts in time of fear. God comforts in time of fear. As you look at verse number one, there's one command given in that verse, fear not. Isaiah tells the people of Israel not to fear, but he does so knowing they're already afraid. Why are they afraid? They're afraid because they're in double trouble. Physically, they are exiled in Babylonian captivity. Their life and their freedom are not their own. Spiritually, they're bound by guilt of disobedience to God. As you look at Isaiah chapter 42, verses 18 through 25, God calls Israel both deaf and blind. He calls them deaf because they did not hear the word of God. He calls them blind because they did not see the error of their own ways. Israel is in double trouble. Physically, they're at the mercy of an enemy that does not fear God. Spiritually, they are subject to experience more of God's Wrath. They are in double trouble. That's the tension we see at the end of Isaiah chapter 42. But by the time we arrive at chapter 43, the prophet tells Israel, but now, fear not. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not. Isaiah says, I'm not telling you not to fear. No, this is what God says. Fear not. Know how he introduces himself. He says, he's the God who created you and the God who formed you. By identifying himself as the God of creation and the God of formation, God essentially tells Israel this. I'm intimately aware of where you are right now. God made them, God formed them, and God knew they would fall into captivity before they fell into captivity. God created them, God formed them, and God knew their flaws before their flaws exposed them into slavery. God knew the worst about them 
reserve the right to judge them, but according to this text, he doesn't hold it against them. God knew the real Israel, and by his righteous standard, he reserved the right to judge Israel, but he did not hold the worst of Israel against them. Church, that's the radical nature of God's redemptive love for us. God knows us, reserves the right to judge us, but doesn't hold it against us. God knows you. God knows the real you. Not the you that's here on Sunday morning. He knows the you after the benediction, before morning devotion. God knows the real you. God knows the you that you don't post on Facebook. God knows the real parking lot you, the lying, cussing you, the cheating, stealing you. God knows the you that nobody else sees. And based off his righteous standard, God reserves the right to judge you. But because of his redemptive love for you, he doesn't hold it against you. What a comfort to know that in the midst of guilt and disobedience, God tells his people, don't fear. And he explains why he tells them not to fear. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. Look at the layers of this comfort God gives to his children. He first of all tells them, listen, you don't have to fear because I have redeemed you. In the midst of being in this double trouble, in the midst of being in exile and disobedience, God tells Israel, you don't have to fear because I bought you back. And the same is true with us in our Christian walk, that even though we have been bound by sin, guilty of sin, and still have a sin nature in us, God tells his children, you do not have to fear because I have redeemed you. How do you know you've been redeemed? One Friday on the hill called Calvary, Jesus paid it all yes. and he bought us back. We have been redeemed. But there's another layer to it because not only says I've been redeemed, he says I call you by name. It's a contrast here because initially he says they were both deaf and and blind, but now he says, I've called you by name, which suggests to us that God no longer looks at them based on their transgressions. He looks at them based on his grace, that he identifies them not by what they have done, but he identifies them by what he has done for them. They've been redeemed. Then he adds one more layer to it by saying, you are mine. That phrase, you are mine paints the picture of a king having a personal stash of jewelry separated from his other riches. That while he enjoys all the gold and all the jewels, he has a personal stash of jewelry that he keeps to himself. Essentially, God tells Israel, you are no longer public property. You are now the prized possession of an eternal king. Listen, you don't have to fear because I've redeemed you, I've called you by name, you are mine. And this gives us a foretaste of glory divine. Because just as God did this for Israel, Jesus Christ did that for us at Calvary. While we were bound in exile of sin, guilty of our sin nature, Jesus Christ hung, bled, and died for our sins. It says, listen, you don't have to fear because I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You belong to me. You are mine. Thank God we have been redeemed. And I understand that in this modern age of 2020, we don't get excited as we should about redemption because redemption doesn't look like a new car. Redemption doesn't look like a new house. It doesn't look like a new job promotion or or a new material thing. But when you realize how deep in sin you were, when you realize how low sin had you, and God pulled you out of the pit of sin and brought you back more than a new house, more than a new spouse, more than money, prestige, or fame, you need 
needed a savior and Jesus Christ came through 42 generations, died for your sins and brought you back, it will make you shout, thank God I am redeemed. Yeah, yeah. Now I hear some of y'all because you're reading the text and you see that God is telling Israel they have been redeemed but they're still in captivity. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. You're reading the text. And you're saying, how in the world are they redeemed when they're still bound in captivity? I'm glad you asked. Let's look closely at verse number one. Look at the verbs that are presented in verse number one. If you'll notice these words here, have redeemed and have formed are past tense. The verbs are and mine are now present tense. Verbs. Scholar contend those past tense verbs of have redeemed and have called is God's way of telling his resume about Israel's redemption. In Exodus chapter 3, God tells Moses through a burning bush, listen, I've heard the cries of my people, I've listened to their groans, and I've come to deliver them. Scholars contend that God is telling Israel that you don't have to fear Babylon based on what I did in Egypt. You don't have to fear now based on what I did then. If I did it before, yes. I'm able to do it again. And maybe that's a word for somebody here today who's trying to figure out, God, how are we going to get past coronavirus? And God is telling you, listen, if I've done this before, I'm able to do it again. That's why we don't need to trip about this pandemic if God brought us out of AIDS, bird flu, whatever pandemic before, he's able to do it again. That's why you don't need a trip about this new doctor's report. If God healed your body before, he's able to do it again. That's why you don't need to worry about how you're going to make ends meet. If God made a way of provision before, he's able to provide again. That's why we don't need to trip about what's going on right now. If God did it before, he's shown us able to do it again. God comforts in time of fear. Not only that, it's another way he shows us he's a radical redeemer. Verse 2 lets us know that God is there in all seasons. God is there in all seasons. Verse 2 is interesting. Because it's a contrast and shift from verse number one. Verse one, God gives them a word of comfort. But in verse two, God gives them a word of warning. And you know it's a word of warning because it starts with the word when. Letting them know of the ever-changing seasons Israel is about to face. He does not say if, as there, there's a possibility they could remove themselves from the situation. No, he says when because it's an inevitable, ever-changing season they're going to face. He then uses picture language of fire and flood to describe these ever-changing seasons. Fire and flood, two elements of nature that are unpredictable but can cause devastating outcomes at any given moment. It does not take much for water to flood anything at anywhere, anytime. Just a few drops of water can turn into a massive flood in a short amount of time. It doesn't take much for fire to burn anything. Just a few small embers can turn into a massive flame and burn anything at any time. He uses the picture language of fire and flood to describe the ever-changing seasons of life. And those picture language words there are not just talking about nature. We can attribute that to life. We use phrases like we're drowning in debt. We are drowning in depression. We have been burned by loved ones, scorched by heartbreak. It describes the ever-changing seasons that we face in life. And here is where I have a problem with the text because God tells them about these seasons they're going to face, but he doesn't do anything to stop them. If you look at verse number two, God is still talking. And he tells Israel they're going to face these seasons of fire and 
flood and he does absolutely nothing to stop it. Church, this lets us know divine redemption is not based on prevention. Because sometimes God will allow these seasons to come into your life and he won't do anything about it. God is fully aware of the seasons you're about to face and he won't do a doggone thing to stop them. This is why you can be a Christian and deal with a global pandemic. Because God is aware of the seasons you're about to face and he won't do anything to stop it. This is why you can be a Christian with Donald Trump in the White House. Because God is aware of the seasons you're about to face and he won't do anything to stop it. This is why you can be a Christian that goes through a pandemic and see your loved ones die of the virus. Because God is aware of the season you're about to face and he won't do anything to stop it. This is why you can be a Christian who has cancer. Because God is aware of the season you're about to face and he won't do anything to stop it. This is why you can be a Christian with wayward children. Even though you brought them to Sunday school, you brought them to Bible study, you brought them to BTU, and it seems like those jokers want to go left when you tell them to go right, it's because God is aware of the seasons you're about to face, and he will not do anything to stop it. This is why you can be a Christian with financial or mental health problems, even though you try to do everything right, you pay your tithes, you come to church, and you still end up with a pink slip, it's because God is aware of the seasons you're about to face, and he won't do anything to stop it. But, there's still comfort in verse number two. That even when God does not prevent it, God gets present in it and will preserve you through it. That even when God does not keep the season from you, God gets in the season with you and carries you through it. That even though he may not keep it from you, he gets in it with you and keeps you through it. That even though God may not prevent these seasons from coming, God gets present in it and preserves you through it. Don't you see his presence in verse number two? When you pass through waters, yes. I will be with you. That's God's calling card in the time of trouble. That when we go through the ever-changing seasons of life, God says you don't have to fear because I will be with you. If you don't believe me, just check his resume. Psalms 23 and 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Here's why. Thou art with me. Even in Matthew chapter 1, at the conception of Christ, the angel tells Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which is to say, God is with us. Matthew chapter 28, after Jesus got out of the grave, he told his disciples as he was going back to heaven, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Hebrews 13 and 5 reminds us, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Psalm 46 and 1, God is our refuge and strength. Here it is, a very present help in times of trouble. And right here in the text, God tells the children of Israel and tells us, when you pass through waters, I will be with you. That's his calling card in our time of trouble. That even though God doesn't prevent it, God gets present in it. That's why you don't have to worry about what you're going through because God says you're not in it by yourself. This text teaches us that God has an I will for our win. When you pass the waters, I will be with you. So the question this morning is, what is your win? Sickness? God says, I will be with you. A pandemic? I will be struggles on your job? I will be with you. Furloughed and wondering how you're going to let ends meet? I will be with you. For every win you face in life, God says, I will. But not only that, 
It not only shows us that God has an I will for our wins, God also has a shall not for our wins. It's right there in verse number two. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. When you go through the flame, it shall not consume you. That even though God does not prevent it, God gets present in it. And as he's present in it, he's active in it because he's keeping you through it. That God is not a silent participant in your struggles. That as he's present in it, he decides to preserve you through it. Here we have a clear picture of what redemption looks like. Redemption is not based on prevention. Redemption is based on God getting in it with us and keeping us through it. That even though he does not prevent it, he gets present in it and preserves you through it. If you don't believe me, believe Bible. God did not keep the lion's den from Daniel. God got in the den with Daniel, shut the lion's jaw, and gave him a mattress to go sleep with during the night. God did not prevent the fire furnace from the Hebrew boys. He got in the furnace with the, uh, with the Hebrew boys and kept them through the fire. God did not keep the storm from the disciples. He got in the boat with the disciples and kept them through the storm. And if we be honest, God didn't keep sin from us. God got in it with us by sending his son to die for our sins, giving us his spirit, and keeping us by his grace. That's why some of us can shout in the midst of this pandemic because God has kept us through. No, God did not prevent coronavirus from coming, but God got in it with us and has kept us through it. Even though we've seen loved ones lost, God has still allowed us to have peace that surpasses all understanding. Even though we have seen some heartbreak and financial troubles, God continues to get in it with us and keep us through this hard time. That's why I agree with the hymn writer, oh, to be kept by Jesus. I'm kept by the power of God that even when God does not prevent it, God gets present in it and preserves us through it. God is there in all seasons. Another way he shows us he's a radical redeemer is in verse 3, that God covers the cost of redemption. God covers the cost of redemption. As he's concluding this word of encouragement to Israel, he reminds them that the role of redeemer is exclusive to God. He tells them in the beginning of verse 3, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. It's a reminder to Israel that if you're going to be redeemed, the only person that's able to redeem you is me. That you can't find redemption anywhere else but in God and God alone. Church, that's a reminder for us today that if you want redemption, the only way to receive redemption is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 reminds us there's no other man under heaven given among men whereby they must be saved except the name Jesus Christ. Jesus says it himself in John chapter 14 verse number 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you want to be redeemed, you've got to go to Jesus Christ. And he talks about this means of redemption. He uses business language in verse number three to show us the cost of redemption. No, he uses the word exchange and uses the word ransom in verse number three. It's business language to show us the cost of redemption. It, that lets us know that God's willing to cover the cost of redemption, but it also lets us know redemption costs. God's willing to pay for it. But it reminds us that there is a cost to redemption. There's no free buybacks. Redemption has a ransom. Forgiveness has a fee. It lets us know redemption costs. If you don't believe me, believe Bible. In Romans, it lets us know the wages of sin is death. The book of Hebrew 
which it says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no redemption of sin. It lets us know redemption call. This is why, help me, Lord Jesus, we need to be careful about sin. I know we don't like to talk about sin in 2020, but sin costs. Sin costs. Sin provides us with a temporary illusion of pleasure, but a permanent reality of debt. Sin costs. It costs you to lie. It costs you to cheat. It costs you to steal. It costs you to do things that God has told you not to do. Yes, you may have enjoyed the turn up the night before, but you paying for it now with a hangover the next day. Sin costs. Yes, you may have enjoyed the one night only, but now you're paying for it with some emotional distress and physical pain. It pays by sin. Sin costs. Whenever we commit sin, there comes a price with it. Sin costs. And if we're not careful, sin will leave us with a debt that we cannot pay and won't give us time to pay it back. But thank God that Jesus Christ covers the cost of redemption. It shows us that in verse 3. He says, I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you. Again, theologians contend these phrases are God's way of touting his resume and showing the price he was willing to pay for the Israelites. Egypt, we saw that God gave in exchange for them. We see that happen in the book of Exodus as they go through the ten plagues. God literally kills Egypt for the sake of Israel. Cush and Seba, scholars contend, are nations God gave back to the Persians as Persia helped Israel get out of Babylonian captivity. It lets us know that God is willing to cover the cost of redemption. But God does not base redemption on the value of what it is. He bases redemption on the value of what he's willing to pay. When we look at our lives, the Bible reminds us our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. Yet God is willing to use everything he has to pay the filthy rags. That God goes above and beyond the price of what he wants to redeem to show the value of the redeemed. Let me try it this way. My, I'm, I'm the son of a Baptist preacher. My dad would tell me that fair exchange ain't never been wrong. He would say that if somebody wants something from you freely, he was let you know fair exchange ain't never been wrong. So, for instance, if you want my tie, I get your socks. Fair exchange ain't never been wrong. If you want my watch, I look at your bracelet, we exchange, fair exchange ain't never been wrong. Here, Isaiah kind of flips the script and says, listen, unfair exchange is necessary for redemption. All right. All right. That God is so radical in his love for us that he goes above and beyond to exchange more than what we're worth. That God doesn't base redemption off the value of you. Because you and your sinful self ain't no other good way. He bases the value of redemption by what he's willing to pay, and that's everything. Look at what God gives up for us. He, he exchanges eternity for time. He exchanged immortality for mortality. He exchanged righteousness for our sin. And he exchanged his life. Come on now. Come on now. What a sweet exchange that takes place in Calvary. That one Friday evening on a hill called Calvary, he died in my place. Yeah. Yeah. He died till the sun refused to shine. Yeah. He died until the moon dripped in blood. He died until the earth reeled and rocked like a drunken man. He died, he died. until the centurion said, surely, surely, surely. this man was the preacher. son of God. Come on, he died to exchange his life for yours. Yes. And right early Sunday morning, yeah, Lord, he got up from the grave with all power in his hands. And because Jesus lives, we're able to say, I am redeemed. Yeah. That's why the songwriter said, I am redeemed, bought with a price. 
Jesus has changed my whole life. If anybody asks you uh, just who I am, tell me I am redeemed. Where there was hate, now love abides. Where there was confusion, now peace reigns. I am a child. I'm a child of the King. And it's all
touch each and every one of us.